Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrea Martins from XP Inc's Investor Relations team. I would like to thank you all for attending this online session. We are honored to receive Bob McCoy, uh, Bob McCoy, sorry, Global Head of Capital Markets at NASDAQ and Lauren Dillard, who is the Head of Global Information Services also at NASDAQ. As you know, XP Inc is a NASDAQ listed company since December of 2019 and a very happy one, by the way. Uh, so we've been building a close relationship in the past 12 months and uh, we will be long-term partners, I'm pretty sure of it. So Bob and Lauren, uh, although you are a widely known company, there is a growing interest here in Brazil to get to know you a little bit better and understand how you became such a reference and now a company that is much more complex than a stock exchange, right? So again, on behalf of XP Inc, thank you so much for being here. And Bob, it would be great if you could please provide us with a brief overview of NASDAQ for us to start the session. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. It's, a, it's an honor to be here with you. And we do have a tremendous partnership. And I know that uh, we, we, we'll love during this session to talk about the fantastic IPO day that we enjoyed in New York back uh, in December of last year. Um, NASDAQ is, is very interesting to understand because most people think of us for what we do at our core, which is listing stocks and trading stocks. And I sit in the listing side of the, of the business and uh, we have a large trading business. And when I joined NASDAQ, that's uh, all that we did was equity trading and listing of stocks. And today we are a, uh, a company that has a uh, 20 billion dollar market cap, almost 20 billion dollar market cap. Uh, we have a number of different business units and very similar to XP, you know, 50, almost 50 years ago, uh, a number of entrepreneurs saw that things could be done better and could be done differently using technology, using communication that was available to them and really revolutionized the markets first in the US and then globally. And so NASDAQ has been able to leverage that. And as a public company, we've moved beyond just being a listing and trading venue. And uh, Lauren's gonna talk about her global information services business, which is one of the fastest growing areas at NASDAQ, but that's our index and data parts of our business. We also have a very large market technology business that does trading and regulatory or surveillance technology. In fact, uh, the local exchange in Brazil, B3, is a, is a very happy customer uh, of NASDAQ. And we sell that technology to 125 exchanges around the world. We not only trade equities, but we trade options and futures and commodities and, and run central clearing houses around the globe. And within our listings business, we don't just accept companies to come and list with us, we've taken the philosophy that companies have challenges as public companies and how can we as an exchange be a really good partner to them as we are to, to XP and provide the services that you need to be the best public company you can be. And so we have continued to organically grow and acquire businesses to help the companies that are public in the US capital markets to be as successful as they can possibly be. So we're a dynamic and growing organization uh, that does a lot of things and uh, honored to be here today. That's great. So almost 50 years in, in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so Bob, just following up with that, uh, if you could please uh, talk about your background and a little bit how you came uh, to NASDAQ in the first place. So I joined, this is my 14th year at NASDAQ and I did things very different than probably a lot of people watching on this webcast and a lot of people in their career, which is many people become part of an organization and then decide that they are being constrained and wanna go out and do the entrepreneurial thing. Um, and certainly uh, a great example of that has been some of the wonderful companies that we've been blessed from Brazil to have listed on our market. But I did the entrepreneurial thing first. So I actually founded a broker dealer uh, back uh, many years ago. Uh, I ran that for about 20 years and then recognized that the market had changed and there were th certain things changing in my life and that I wanted to do something very differently 
and took the skills uh, that I had learned there, not only as an entrepreneur and wanting to help other entrepreneurs, but being able to take the experience that I had in the capital markets and to help uh, you know, facilitate that running the capital markets business here at NASDAQ and being responsible for our Latin American business. Great, thank you, Bob. So Lauren, if you could also tell us about your background and how you came to NASDAQ. Sure, and thank you again for having us today. Um, we're excited about the partnership and all the, the exciting things we can do in the future. So I actually joined NASDAQ about a year ago um, to run the information services business. And I spent the prior almost 20 years actually in um, at an alternative investment management firm. So I came up on the kind of alternative side. Um, my last job there was actually running um, the business that put together fund to funds and secondaries and co-investments. Um, so I had the great experience of seeing the rise of alternatives as we think about it in portfolios. Um, it, I also, as a result of that, saw the need, the rising need, I would say, of data and on really modern technology to help drive investment decisions. Um, and so that's why what NASDAQ is doing in the mission, um, which frankly is quite aligned with XP, one would, one would say, um, to help drive investment decisions was an exciting move for me. So it's been very fun. I completely echo what Bob says. When people think of NASDAQ, they think of an exchange, which will always be core to our mission and helping our companies that are listed on our exchange. But we really are a technology company that is providing data and analytics um, for the broad, arguably capital markets, but even markets beyond that. So it's been exciting, but I definitely have a different, a different background um, coming up through the alt side. Yeah, Andrea, uh, Lauren joined us from another fantastic uh, NASDAQ listed company, the Carlisle Group. That's right. Yeah, it's the, the ecosystem, right? As we say, uh, everything's tied, everyone knows uh, each other. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Uh, really interesting transition that you just, that you just uh, described. So talking about the business that you, that you lead at NASDAQ, right? Global Information Services. What is uh, the GS, uh, GIS, sorry? Um, what is what is the mission? Could you please uh, walk us through? Yeah, absolutely. So Global Information Services is about 30% of NASDAQ as, as you look at the, the revenue footprint. And it has three sort of distinct parts, but it, its North Star is how do we provide data analytics and transparency to the investment management community to make investing decisions. So that's our core mission. It's very similar to what I've you know, I see come, come out of XP around democratizing investing and providing data. So the core was the market data that comes off of the exchange. So providing clear transparency around trading. So whenever you see a, a quote, um, that's a data feed that's coming from, from our sort of core piece of our business. Um, and then we have a very large index footprint. So we can talk about the index business. Um, it's quite global. Obviously the NASDAQ 100 is sort of the core to that. Um, but we have thematic indexes that we can talk about. Um, and then the last piece is, is a large analytics business. And um, some of this has been built uh, via acquisitions. So we brought on eVestment, which is a, a very large institutional database. If you want to think about it, it's like a storefront into managers. And we can talk about how managers use it, how investors use it. Um, and then we added on to that a... Um, cloud-based multi-asset portfolio management tools. So you can see your entire platform, see your entire portfolio. It's obviously been a really important um, tool to have during the volatility as you can watch both the public market volatility, but you can see how your private market pieces of your portfolio, um, how, that need, and if you, how that balances. And if you need to rebalance, then it's obviously a natural step for um, asset owners or investors to go into investment, look at other managers, try to figure out how to augment their portfolio, and then come back into that tool. So um, that's the analytics and data piece of our business. So we've got three distinct pieces, but they all have that sort of North Star of how do you provide transparency into the investing community? So I believe you have a lot on your table right now, right, Lauren? <laughs> it's, it's, it's fun, yes, it's definitely fun. Pretty sure you will deliver. Uh, 
Coming back to Bob, this is a fairly straightforward question, and I have an answer of my own, but we want to hear you. <laughs> Why should a company list on NASDAQ, Bob? So I think, Andrea, that there's there's five reasons why a company chooses us. Uh, one is certainly the brand and the company you keep. We have been blessed with having the game-changing, innovative, entrepreneurial companies that have changed the global economy over the past 25 years list on our market. And whether those are companies from a Starbucks in the consumer area to obviously the fantastic technology companies and the five largest companies in the U.S. capital markets uh, all listed with us. And so when you think about uh, who you want to be associated with and aligned with from a fundamental philosophical standpoint, you know, NASDAQ is, is the right place for companies that are thinking about changing the future. Uh, clearly, we've already talked about transactions. We are the largest transaction platform globally. Um, and certainly by far the largest in the United States. So more transactions go through our pipes every day and we have the most efficient trading transaction technology. And so we can, we can deliver the best performance for companies when they trade. I spoke quickly about our services. So those services that we provide to companies as they transition from private to public and have a whole new set of challenges that they need to meet as a public company. NASDAQ is able to deliver the services that they need to meet those challenges. And the best part about it is that a newly listed company that have so many new things that on their plate, they get these services from their exchange. We've been able to put together this package for them of services that they get from their exchange and don't have to worry about a whole bunch of different vendors. All they have to do is just continue to work with NASDAQ, which is we think a wonderful, uh, wonderful opportunity for them. We have tremendous branding and marketing assets and whether those are physical ones like our NASDAQ tower in Times Square, all the way through digital assets, social media, more and more companies are using social media, Facebook, Instagram uh, to tell their story and NASDAQ helps facilitate all of that, working with our companies and everything that we do, uh, we do at a much lower price point than our US competitors. So. The nice part is you get so much extra value out of being listed on NASDAQ than you do with the other exchange in the US because we're able to provide all of these services and support at a much lower price. Yeah, I agree with that. That's that's why I said we are a happy NASDAQ listed company. <laughs> you, you guys have made our lives easier in the past, uh, I mean, years or so, six months. So I, I fully agree. So, um, Bob, um, how did NASDAQ uh, came to dominate the technology IPO space, uh, both in the U.S. and overseas? I mean, it goes without saying that this is a vital sector for future development globally, and you play a key role connecting these entrepreneurs with the market, right? Yes, but Andrea, let me pull it back. And, and when we talk about technology, I think technology is a proxy for innovative, disruptive, growth-oriented companies. So, you know, uh, Starbucks uses tremendous technology in order to, to run their, their business. We have a, a, a amazing group of biotech companies that have chosen to list with NASDAQ. It's actually our largest group of companies is in healthcare. And there's so much technology and innovation that is coming in the healthcare area. And then when you, it comes to tech, We've been blessed by the fact that NASDAQ was there to support Intel and Comcast and Microsoft and Google and Apple and Facebook and all of these amazing companies from their earliest days. So when they needed a place to raise capital and for their investors to be able to trade, when other exchanges would not accept them, we were there to support them. And then over time, they've grown to be, as I said, the, we have these five large technology companies. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Amazon, especially with the amazing, uh, and Microsoft with the amazing growth that they've seen just over the past uh, few years. But um, to have trillion dollar market cap companies listed on NASDAQ, um, especially in the technology area, really shows the dominance uh, of our platform uh, in terms of those companies wanting to be associated with them. And um, my father used to say, success breeds success. 
and the success we've had with technology companies coming to us and the work that we've done with them and helping them to uh, thrive as part of our environment has been a magnet for other companies who want to be part of the NASDAQ family. And so we work really hard to make sure that we can have them and whether they are technology companies from Brazil or ones from uh, China, we have some of the largest companies from, from China. Um, you know, when you think about Brazil, you think about education companies that have come to our platform over the past couple of years between Arco and Afia and now Vasta, which has an announced that they're coming to NASDAQ later this month. Um, using tremendous technology to be able to deliver their important service, especially during this uh, time of COVID. So I might change the definition from tech companies to innovative, innovative companies, right? So it's a broader spectrum. It's I definitely so. your, your I, DNA, right? Yeah, I, I think that making it all about technology companies is uh, it kind of excludes the other yeah. amazing companies that have, have come to us I mean, think about the car company that has really revolutionized and defined the way uh, that we're that we're being transported, which is Tesla. You know, this, this is a this is a two hundred billion dollar company now. They just passed their tenth uh, listing anniversary on Nasdaq last month, uh, and now there's EV car companies all over the world that are being built. We're going to have an EV car company from China list with us in the next few weeks. But this is this is category defining, and their market cap uh, compared to the traditional car companies in the U.S. You know they're 200 billion. Uh, Ford is about 35 billion. General Motors is 40 billion. So combined, the other two major car companies don't even have half of the market cap of of Tesla. Yes, that's that's mind blowing indeed. So uh, moving to, to Lauren, uh, Lauren, have your views changed in light of the COVID-19 pandemics? I mean, about the business, about the market, your projects and so forth? Um, no, I would actually pick up exactly where Bob left off. I mean, um, we are seeing um, hyper heightened digitalization. And if you think about what we do, it's we try to provide, you know, cloud based, very modern technology um, to drive quick investment decisions and provide quick access to data. And you're only seeing that being heightened by the fact that everyone's at home. Um, and so, so if anything, I think we've um, in some cases moved up our plans um, or leaned in a bit more on providing alternative platforms um, where you can get quick access to data. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's changed our plans per se. I will say that um, staying on the index theme of the companies that are listed on NASDAQ, when you look at our book of indexes and our business there, they really are kind of what, what I would refer to as like almost like the modern industrial. It's the way that, especially in light of COVID, we are all living today, um, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's using, you know, Peloton. And so um, our thematic indexes that we had in our queue and our roadmap, um, are, we're certainly seeing, seeing almost kind of pressure to get some more out, you know, in a faster manner. So, so you know, I think what you're, you're hearing from us is innovation um, has only been accelerated in light of COVID um, and our, our means of, of having a dispersed workforce, going back to that being the kind of root of where NASDAQ was formed um, in digitalizing a, you know, an exchange is, is consistent with everything that we're seeing across across the globe. Yeah, that's so interesting. We felt the same thing in XP. A lot of things accelerated, right? That should happen in three years from now, happen, I mean, in a span of months. So yeah. we, we we saw the same thing. So about yeah. let's talk about our, our, our country, if I may, Lauren. Uh, what is your view of the Brazilian market? How does Brazil fit, fit into your plans? Yeah, I mean, Look, I think Brazil is a, is a key part of our um, expansion plans as we think about um, the dynamics that are going on in Brazil and what we have to offer. Um, and I don't need to go through, you know, the rise of investing, how you're seeing, I mean, you're seeing that as well, whether it's on the institutional side or the retail side, 
um, and the demographics around the investing community. So, you know, if you go back to our job is to provide technology and to provide data for those investing themes, we, we have been, have already had plans and continue to have accelerated plans um, to continue to provide our technology, our investing tools in Brazil. I think one very, very clear area for us is the NASDAQ 100 has done extraordinarily well. As mentioned, it's essentially um, a modern industrial at this time and, and that's heightened and we would love to provide um, access to that index, access to the futures, being able to provide the ability to trade and get exposure to those companies. Um, we have ongoing discussions um, quite real time on how we can launch ETFs. We think that's a good, um, a good product for investors there. And we've been working with several you know, local, local players to be able to partner to provide ETFs there. So you know, when you think about what we can offer on our, out of our index, um, out of our index portfolio, that's where we think there's probably the easiest and frankly, best products really to lead out into, into Brazil. And then, um, and across Latin America actually. And then when you think about our portfolio tools, whether it's the portfolio management tool or whether it's investment, and I know there's databases, you know, that are local, but, you know, when you really think about what that's doing, that is providing access. It's, it's like a window shop into all the institutional managers' products and managers use it to compare with others. They look at analytics and then asset owners or investors can look at it to see you know, what would be interesting in their portfolio, where they have, where they maybe are missing um, a piece that they need to augment. Um, they can compare managers. You know, we obviously have a heavy push um, from, the, from our investors around ESG and disclosures there. It's, it's got close to a thousand investors that use it and um, tens of thousands of products in it. So it really is used by both the managers to compare themselves and then it's used by the investors to compare. And, and way, way back when it was formed, um, I should say, it was formed by, by allocators or consultants. So that is the genesis. So you know, when we think about how assets are moving in and out of Latin America, and I think you, you had a really interesting piece on your website about searches for, um, for other investment products that were you know, international investment products, this would be a type where of, of, of tool that you could go in and see and compare. So when we think about providing tools, it's, it's totally consistent with, um, with what you would expect is how can we provide transparency? How can we provide data? We're not an asset manager, we're a technology company. And, and um, we certainly see the dynamics um, shifting um, from your client base. And, and we would love to be able to you know, service that with our data. That's the way we think about it. Thank you. This will help me lay down today that Brazil is in your plans, right? And that you're confident about, uh, about the country. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Bob, we were just discussing right before uh, the live session about the IPO day, the listing day of XP. And I said that uh, all partners of XP, everyone who was, was there or was in Brazil, uh, it was a remarkable day. Everyone remembers like a real special day. So could you really uh, please talk about the XP NASDAQ relationship and some behind of the scenes action from IPO day? <laughs> well, I think, I think a lot of people can see the behind the scenes action if they go to, to YouTube or, uh, or Facebook or Instagram, they can see all the amazing day that we had. And I know that uh, Guillermo is uh, very good friends with uh, Andreas Street from Stone. So I think that there may have been some competition as to who could have the better IPO celebration uh, between Stone and, uh, and XP. Uh, the year before when Stone went public on NASDAQ, they raised the bar for uh, celebrations in Times Square. You brought the Brazilian football match cheering mentality to rock Times Square and then when uh, XP came uh, just a little over one year later, that just you blew the top off of, uh, of Times Square. It was completely amazing day. I will say that one of the, that we had the most people ever on the screen uh, within our studio uh, on, for TV uh, at 9.30 when we did the opening bell. 
because as you know, only a, only a small number of people were supposed to be in there, but everybody just kind of uh, just crashed the gates of the of the door and got themselves. Sorry about that, Bob. Because they <laughs> we can help it. <laughs> it was uh, it was fantastic, and um, the enthusiasm and the energy of uh, the XP IPO uh, is going to be hard to replicate because uh, you. You know, as we would say in the U.S., you guys really brought it. It was uh, so fun. It's one that uh, I will remember fondly for my entire career. I know that our CEO references it a lot because she enjoyed it so very much. And the one thing that that I would say stands out: XP IPO, Afia, Arco, uh, Stone is every IPO uh, celebration is authentic. That's one of the things that we really pride ourselves on at NASDAQ is we get to know the companies and we make sure that when we're doing something, it's not cookie cutter. It's very bespoke for every company that lists with us so that we get to know your uh, personality, your culture. And then when we come, when it comes to something as important as an IPO day, that we really make sure that it's representative of that. Uh, and there's no doubt that, uh, you all really brought it on IPO day. Yeah, but thanks to you, you you, you guys set the stage right and provided provided the conditions for us to for us to do that. You have a quite a nice space there, and the structure is is amazing. Thank you. So, Lauren, uh, again uh, about Brazil, uh, where do you see the greatest opportunity uh, for growth here um, in our country? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned the the asset demographics that um, as as we look at as we look at it from the investing side, and I mean, I know I said it, but I'll say it again. I mean, I believe that access to things like the Nasdaq 100 futures around it, being able to invest in ETFs, um, and the creation of products is what I is what we are certainly excited about, um, and. And you know all the all the reports we see, all the investing numbers. I mean, certainly watching um, what we see with NXP, and certainly even on the institutional side. You know, we believe access to really high quality products is is central and core. And and we're obviously very proud of of the suite of products we have around the, the Nasdaq 100. And so that's like a natural fit for us. Um, but you know, it, if you watch the sort of maturation in the investing community. It's all about how do you get the right information into the hands of your investors to be able to make the right investment decisions, both within, within Brazil and then outside Brazil. And so, um, you know, that's kind of core to the NASDAQ ethos, um, provide transparency, democratize investing, um, make investing accessible to everyone. And, and that's, that's where we see the opportunity. Now, it means you have to have um, data, it means you have to have um, access to obviously analytics around that. And it means, you know, it should be low cost, obviously with the, the low cost environment, um, we see that and we, we wanna be responsive to how we provide data and analytics um, around that. But as investing democratizes, it's all about making sure that there's transparency. And I love the core mission of XP around education. That's core to NASDAQ as well. How do you educate? How do you get data to drive the best investing decisions? You know. From, from our seat, the NASDAQ 100 and the family, you know, we believe is a, is a great um, is a great family to invest. But broadly speaking, it's providing transparency and data to, to make really, really solid investing decisions. Thanks, Lauren. So still, still with you, Lauren, uh, Mercado Libre, which is another outstanding case, right? Uh, was the first Latin American company to enter in your in your index. Um, what are your thoughts, right, on the global uh, reach of the index, uh, maybe the participation of uh, emerging markets uh, going forward? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when we think about our index family and taking it to emerging markets, and we have been doing that, we recently launched something in Malaysia, we've launched something in Taiwan. It's all about, and obviously we're super keen, way back in my life, I was a recovering tax professional. So we're super keen to recognizing and understanding that regulatory environments, the structure has to be right. Um, so, you know, we we try to take our products and make sure that we're partnering with people on the ground to make sure that 
we can structure, whether it's in futures, um, whether it is in pure indexes, whether it's in some sort of exchange traded product, um, that we can make sure it's accessible because you know we recognize you can't just port structures around the globe. Um, so, but honestly, that's that's a core part of, of Nasdaq's expansion. Um, you know, we've got great tools and we've got great products, and others say that as well. So I'm I'm not saying anything on that, but it's all about making them accessible to the people um, that can invest in them, and so making sure that the structures um, work and to make sure that they're cost efficient. Um, obviously, that's we, we we view that as as super important. So whether you're accessing something on a public market or whether you're accessing something in the private sphere, um, that should be the core ethos. So we have been doing that across Asia, across Europe, um, uh, across, um, we, we recently launched um, several uh, products in Australia. So it's all about making sure that the products are right for the investing community on the ground. Um, in some cases, they're looking for more fixed income. In some cases, they're looking for, for higher returns. Um, and we, you know, we look at the suite of products and make sure we can structure it uh, accordingly. So. That's the way we see, but we have been porting our products around the world um, as, as others have, but it's all about making sure it's right for the investing community on the ground. Andrea, I think what's also interesting about the NASDAQ 100, which differentiates it from the other two major indices in the US, is not only just the things that Lauren talked about, it's the, you know, the new industrials, it's the, the, the really global game-changing companies that are part of the index, but it's the only major index in the US that allows for foreign companies to be in the index. And so you referenced Mercado Libre, uh, they're uh, as a $50 billion market cap company just past their 20th founding uh, last year. We were, we were so pleased to, to celebrate that uh, uh, their growth. It's, it is truly amazing. And certainly they've uh, benefited by uh, their success uh, during the pandemic, they have been one of the key companies being able to provide services for uh, lots of, of Brazil and, and other parts of, of Latin America. But um, we have four companies from China. We have a couple companies from Europe. So it's not, it is truly a global index of the leading companies that are listed on NASDAQ. I won't say in the US, they're on NASDAQ. Uh, from all over the globe, which the other major indices exclude um, when you when you think about uh, the Dow or the S and P 500, and so that's uh, one of the things that really uh, is such a wonderful attribute, I think, for uh, for the Nasdaq 100. Yeah, and it's and it's as you said, it's crazy to think that uh, I mean XP, Stone, Afia, Arco, I mean. It's booming, right? The perspective, uh, talking about Brazil, not general uh, emerging markets, but uh, I mean, at least in my in my opinion, the trend here is to more and more companies uh, access you guys, and we are excited to see that. So the the last question uh, for Bob, uh, we've been through a market turmoil, unprecedented uh, crisis. Uh, things are getting calmer, but I mean. This, this crisis will have uh, several effects. Uh, how do you see the IPO outlook for the second half of 2020 uh, and, and maybe even going forward? I know it's hard to predict, but uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it's interesting for you to ask me that this question today because I have a very, very different answer than I would have had back at the end of March or early April. Um, we've just seen an amazing... I guess the word would be resurrection at some level of the uh, U.S. IPO market from, you know, going ab absolutely to a complete stop uh, during that period of time. And everybody uh, stopping their plans, if they were writing their S1, putting down or F1, putting down their their pens and not moving forward to just one of the most amazing months that we've ever had at NASDAQ with uh, 30 uh, IPOs during the month of June. Now just think about that. We had 180-ish IPOs each year for the past two years. 
And if you take 30 and extrapolate that out for a year, that's, you know, over 350 IPOs uh, on NASDAQ, which would be just an, a, an incredible year. And we, um, and we had such a uh, amazing month during a time when people are quarantined, nobody can, can travel. Um, the global economy is, is challenged. And so uh, I think today, based upon what I'm seeing and the success that those companies have had, because the average uh, IPO is doing exceedingly well, the NASDAQ 100 that we just talked about is up 22% uh, for the, the calendar year 2020. Uh, so I, many companies are uh, moving their plans forward, taking advantage of the window. I, I referenced uh, Vasta, which, um, which announced their, publicly announced their plans to do an IPO uh, a week ago uh, with their filing with the SEC, public filing with the SEC and, and to come to NASDAQ. So we're, we think that the, the market um, is begin, not only beginning to recover, but has recovered for IPOs and that uh, feels very strong for at least the balance of the year. Um, and uh, we, we certainly hope going into 2021 also. Great, thank you, Bob. That was a fast recovery, right? <laughs> who would have, who would have thought? Amazing. Right? I don't think anyone could. I don't think anyone would have suspected it. As I said at the end of March, that we would have that 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 there was any chance that we could do thirty IPOs in June. Great, great. So, so guys, we are uh, running out of time. Uh, Lauren, Bob, this was such a great conversation. Thank you again for participating in Expert. We look we look forward to reinforcing our partnership further in the next years to come. Um, and also, it's important to highlight that Adina Friedman, who is the CEO of NASDAQ, will also be participating in Expert in a session with our CFO, XP Inc. CFO, Bruno Constantino, on this Friday, 4.20 p.m. Uh, Brazil time. Okay? So, again, Lauren, Bobby. Wait, wait, wait. But the other thing, Mark. Sorry. Andrea, you need to mention the fact that in something in the same vest, I will be hosting the uh, closing bell on Friday right after that. Uh, That's it. That's it. That. So we will have. Thank you for reminding. Bruno and uh, Adina will have a, a fireside chat for almost an hour. And then I will be hosting the uh, closing bell, virtual closing bell to celebrate uh, XP and 3 million people signing up for XP this year, the largest. Uh, conference in the world and the largest, uh, certainly going all digital. Uh, congratulations to uh, XP to be able to uh, pivot uh, and execute in such an amazing way. You and the team have done a tremendous job. And thank you for allowing Lauren and I to participate today. Great. So everyone, don't lose the, the closing bell, right, with Bob and the session with Bruno and Adina. Uh, I mean, it's a great event. Thank you for being a part of it. You are definitely key to this process. And I hope to see you soon, uh, Bob and Lauren. Have, have a great day and everyone have a great event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us.